Blue Switchboard. Hello, um, I want to report a missing person. She's my children's mum. And when me and the kids woke up in the morning, she wasn't there. But her car's still outside. Has she has an accident somewhere or some kind of medical episode come to some harm where she can't raise the alarm herself? Half the time, they've been found safe and well. I thought she might have just gone for a nice little weekend away somewhere. The days went by, and uh, we started to realise that um, something was, had probably gone wrong. You just instinctively know that something's wrong, something's not right. You are under the rest. Suspicion about her Sarah Wellgrave. In the middle of the Kent countryside lies the quiet residential area of New Ash Green. New Ash Green was built in the 1960s and 70s as a kind of model village. It's a sort of nice bit of suburbia that's been plonked in the middle of the Kent countryside. Nice place to live for bring up families, the sports clubs, pretty quiet. There is quite a strong community there. Everyone knows each other and supports each other. It was the perfect community for popular beautician Sarah Wellgreen to set up home with her growing family. As a daughter, Sarah was everything you could wish for. She was caring, she was incredible fun to be with, brilliant company on it. You know, we used to love going shopping, out for lunch, going on holiday together. She was feisty, she was very caring. And she'd always, you know, she'd always stand up for the underdog. Loved her children without question. Always there for them. What else can you say? I lived in the same house for the entire time I was in secondary school. I've always been close to my mum. She's, if I ever needed anything or wanted, needed someone to speak to, she would have always been there for me. As well as sons Jack and Lewis from a previous relationship, Sarah also had three children with Ben Lacomba and dedicated her time to her family. Sarah worked incredibly hard for her children. She had her day job, but she also had clients in the evening and at weekends, so she had her official clients at work, she had unofficial ones, and everything she did, she did for her children. If you went out shopping for the day, invariably, she, the money would be spent on the children. She always made sure they had good holidays, Halloween, Easter, birthdays, never missed a thing. My mum, she always used to provide for us. She'd rather go without and see us have everything that she could give us, really. She'd always put us before herself, and it really did make her a good mum. It was great. I was proud of how she was and the woman she was. The couple's dedication to their children meant that when their relationship broke down, they decided to do what was right for the kids. They were going to co-parent the children together and just have different rooms in the house and just bring their, bring their three children up together in a household where they'll have their mum and their dad. Despite the unconventional setup, it worked for both Sarah and Ben, and both started dating once again with Sarah meeting Neil on a dating app in 2016. She'd met Neil, who lived in Farnham. They were quite happy. I did like Neil, and, yeah, from the times I met him, he was a nice bloke. Neil did love my mum. The couple soon got engaged, and there was more exciting news to come. In October, she phoned me up. She was really, really happy. She's just got this brand-new job, pays more money. She'll be better off, the kids will be better off. She'll be able to help me out more with anything I need. So she was really excited to start it. So everything was looking up for her. And she was absolutely thrilled to bits with it. She couldn't wait to get started. And that was, the, like she said, she's in the next phase of my life now. On 9th of October, 2018, just before 8 p.m., Sarah returns home from work still on a high about the new job offer. She'd come home, and she'd been seen arriving, went into the house. Uh, she went to bed, texted her boyfriend, 
um, sent a few text messages to other people. She told the friends that there's always something to look forward to. You've just got to open your eyes and dream. The following morning, Sarah's boyfriend, Neil, texts Sarah. Yet he doesn't receive any reply. After a few hours, he calls Sarah's ex, Ben, to ask if he knows where she is. But Ben tells Neil he thought she was with him. Neil hadn't heard anything, wasn't getting responses back from Sarah, which was unusual. So he had phoned uh, Sarah's parents. Neil rang me and said, I've been trying to get in touch with Sarah. She's not answering her phone. And I thought, well, Sarah could be a bit scatterbrained. She Either her phone would be out of charge or it'd be unplugged or she'd leave it in the car. So I tried to ring her a few times and then I thought, well, when Neil said he couldn't get hold of her, to be honest, I thought maybe she doesn't want to talk to you because it could be a bit intense. She might have just been ignoring him to begin with, which she could do. So when I tried getting hold of my mum and she wasn't picking up her phone, I'd try through Facebook, texting, phoning some more, just any, any possible way out to get hold of her, like tried her other phone, her work phone that she had, but nothing. The following day, Ben reveals Sarah's still not returned home, and concern for her well-being starts to grow. Messaged her again and tried WhatsApp, and then I thought, no, this is this is really really odd. I became quite worried because I just wanted to know if she was all right. It's my mum, like it's the person who's brought me up for my entire life. I just wanted to know that she was okay. After 48 hours and still no sign of Sarah, Ben decides it's time to call the police. Temporary switchboard. Hello, um, I want to report a missing person. Okay. She hasn't and... gone missing before. She lives with me. She's my children's mum. She came home Tuesday night and then we all went to bed. Uh, and then when me and the kids woke up in the morning, she wasn't there but her car's still outside. On Thursday, the 11th of October, Ben Lacomba contacted us to report Sarah had gone missing. He told us that uh, he'd come home from work. He said Sarah had come home just before 8 o'clock and she had gone to her room and she had settled herself into her room, which was on the first floor in their house. They stayed in separate rooms in that house. He told us that after putting the children to bed in the evening, he went to bed himself in the loft converted bedroom. And he said he went to sleep, had a full night's sleep. He'd woken up in the uh, morning and found that Sarah's car was still at the address that she was missing. After Sarah had been reported missing, officers attended the address and we began uh, a missing person investigation. Officers turned to Ben for help to piece together Sarah's last known movements, but he said he fully expected to see her the next morning, as it was a special occasion. He wasn't expecting that, that Sarah would be, would be gone. In fact, that day was one of their children's birthdays, and they had plans, and he'd expected her to be there. Officers carry out a routine search of Sarah's bedroom, and immediately noticed something. What we did find was that Sarah had left behind not only her car, but her car keys, her house keys, her purse, her cash, her bank cards, her handbag. In fact, everything that anybody could tell us that Sarah had was still at the address. Certainly, it looked like she'd gone out without any planning, leaving everything behind. Concern was now growing. There was no way she'd have gone out and left her keys behind. The minute I'd realised that she'd left her handbag behind, with a purse, car keys, and so many other things that Bank Sarah, cards. of all the people, would never have gone without any of those things. For somebody that's gone missing to have left all of those items behind was really strange and really concerning. You just instinctively know 
that something's wrong, something's not right. Something's happened to her. In the quiet suburban area of New Ash Green, concern is building over mum of five, Sarah Wellgreen, who has been missing for two days. With her life seemingly looking up, a new job and a fiancé, police need to ascertain what would make her disappear. So establish a timeline of Sarah's last known movements on the 9th of October, the day she went missing. It was a, a normal day for Sarah. She had taken her children to school that morning. She'd then gone out to meet some of her clients. Uh, she was a, a beauty therapist that used to meet some of her clients at their home addresses, so she went out and saw some of those people and generally had a, what a family were telling us was a normal day. Sarah drove home and went into her home address. She'd settled herself into her bedroom. We know that she phoned her friend and that she was settled down for the night. When she disappeared, the next morning, there was contact between various people who knew her. It was agreed that if she didn't return that day or by the next day, that Ben Lacombe would telephone the police. Kent Police switchboard. Hello, um, I want to report a missing person. She's my children's mum. Concerned that her disappearance was out of character, police issue a missing person appeal to the public. I first became involved when we received a press release from the police initially about a missing person from New Ash Green. They said Sarah Wellgreen had gone missing, there were concerns for her welfare. We get so many um, cases of missing people that you're probably not too worried to start with. Half the time before you've written a, a story, a file copy about a missing person, the police have sent something out saying they've been found safe and well. But there was something more pressing for the police. Sarah had left her car keys and purse at home, leaving only a couple of scenarios to consider. I thought maybe she'd gone out for a run and hurt herself. Has she had an accident somewhere? Has she gone out and, and had some kind of accident or some kind of medical episode come to some harm where she can't raise the alarm herself? With the first few hours of a missing person investigation being critical, police launch a search perimeter around Sarah's home. They set up a five-mile radius around New Ash Green for the search effort, um, scouring woodlands, fields, sheds, wherever anyone can look. I think they've done all the right searches they could within the area, you know, uh, woodlands, scrubland, yeah, the mud flaps. They, they, they've done all the right checks. Desperate to reach out to his mum, Lewis turns to social media, and the village community immediately rally round. Lewis put a call out on Facebook one evening saying his mum was missing and uh, had anybody seen her? And I was thinking, oh, you know, something needs to be done. So I phoned the pavilion. They said, yeah, we can meet people there. We put a shout out on Facebook. I think the whole village answered the call, really. Yeah, yeah. Everyone turned out. The response I got from the post on Facebook, it went quite far very, very quickly. It was shared hundreds of times. It got all, it got all over the social media so quickly. And then it got put into the papers and everything like that as well, just from one little post like that. There was hundreds of people that went. Most of the village in New Ash Green went, and from the surrounding areas went as well. It did give me hope that I would be able to see my mum again. The search began with combining the efforts of the police and, and the community police leading it, of course. We have walked and searched every piece of woodland, every field, every bit of grazing land. There was a sort of lingering hope that she'd be found, you know, maybe she was injured or something, or, you know, something had happened, but she, she was okay, and that they, they would come across her. But the longer it went on, there was just no news at all about, about anything like that. 
With no sighting of an injured Sarah within a five-mile radius, police check her digital footprint for any clues into her whereabouts. The police looked at her telephone evidence, they looked at billing data, they looked at banking evidence, all various sources of evidence, looking at hospitals to see whether or not there was any trace of her. There was nothing, no footprint at all digitally of, of Sarah from that point onwards. With Sarah seemingly having disappeared without a trace, detectives try to delve into her life. We spoke to many people, her family, her friends, and other people in the community, people that Sarah had as clients. We were trying to build up that picture of Sarah. She was a happy person at the time. She had just secured uh, a brand new job offer, which she'd accepted, which came with a fixed salary and a company car. No doubt whatsoever that Sarah would disappear like that. She was so happy. We'd had a drink on the Friday, she was happy. She was full of life. With all logical avenues as to Sarah's whereabouts exhausted, police start to suspect something more sinister has happened. The days went by and uh, we started to realise that um, something was, had probably gone wrong. My suspicions became raised of that something had come to cause Sarah some harm rather than Sarah having just taken herself away. I then was considering, well, who may have caused Sarah harm? Had Sarah gone out and met somebody that was pre-planned and that person may have then caused Sarah harm? Had Sarah um, had somebody come to the address and he had taken her away? But who would have done such a thing? Suddenly, everyone known to her is under scrutiny. We actually had the police turn up at the house to, to see if she was there, and it's like, no, we the ones who've got someone to phone you. She's obviously not here, but obviously they've got to do their job. They've got to come around and check all addresses that she might be at, things like that. So I understand, but turning up to the address where me and my brother are living. Despite searching multiple addresses of family and friends, there is no sign of Sarah. And when they speak to Ben again, he admits that despite playing happy families, there's more to Sarah than meets the eye. He went on to say that Sarah is, a, is life is a bit strange. It's, it was a bit weird. He said, Sarah often would go missing, would often disappear, would go away without telling us that actually um, she would go off and meet other people. Suddenly, police are met with an endless list of suspects. Did Sarah secretly meet someone she knew that evening? Police begin to look closely at anyone Sarah might be romantically involved with, including fiancé Neil, one of the last people Sarah spoke to. The police came round with a search van on the Friday. They were there for a couple of hours because we sat down and they were asking questions, chatting about lots of different things, lots of possibilities, everything like that. Neil tells police that he had a brief conversation with Sarah on the night she went missing. That night I phoned her at 24 minutes past nine. Uh, we had a 15 minute conversation and then we exchanged a couple of texts um, after that. Um, which was normal, and then we said goodnight. Detectives check his phone records and confirm these calls, but he still needs to prove he was at home in Surrey when he made the calls. I had my daughter, who at the time was three, overnight anyway, and so they knew I wouldn't take a three-year-old all the way over to Kent around the M25. As I said to them, look, if that's any concern, then just check the M25 cameras. Neil's story is quickly verified. So attention turns to other friends and acquaintances. We had a lot of people involved in Sarah's life and we did a significant amount of work to show how they could not have been there that evening. They could not have been with Sarah that evening. And in all of the uh, evidence that we found around Sarah, through her messaging, through her contacts, through her phone, we had nothing to say that Sarah had made any plans that night to go anywhere. There was nothing to say that she'd gone out. One week into the investigation and Sarah remains missing. 
you struggle to take it all in to begin with. There's just so much, so many people trying to get hold of you, message you to make sure you're okay. It's hard to explain in a way of how it sort of makes you feel because you're, you're a mixture between angry, upset, worried, and just you just want to know where she is. That's all it is. You just want to know that she's okay. The desperate search for Sarah intensifies. Police trawl CCTV cameras from neighbouring homes in the village on the day Sarah disappeared. We captured on CCTV some footage that we were able to see from a neighbour's address. Sarah drove home and she parked her car outside her home around 5 to 8 in the evening on that Tuesday. She then went into her home address. Police keep watching the CCTV and suddenly all becomes clear. And it was from that moment that he became a suspect for potentially harming Sarah. In the quiet residential village of New Ash Green, the community is desperately waiting for news into the disappearance of Sarah Wellgreen, who vanished from her home the night before her young child's birthday. Ben Lacomba says Sarah returned home from work and both retired to their separate bedrooms. When he woke in the morning, she had gone. But a neighbor's CCTV camera reveals something unusual at 2 a.m. on the night of her disappearance. The CCTV imagery demonstrated captures of a vehicle which was in all ways similar to the vehicle driven by Ben Lacomba. And it had, because it was a taxi, a distinctive logo on the driver's side of the door. And one of the captures, although it was very grainy in the night, had a blur consistent with that same logo. With some expert commissioned work around the imagery that we've got and comparing that to the vehicle itself, we had uh, very strong evidence to say that that footage was that vehicle. Believing the vehicle to be Ben's taxi, detectives trawl CCTV and ANPR cameras in the neighborhood in an attempt to follow the vehicle's movements. His taxi had been caught on CCTV cameras going out of New Ash Green and down country lanes, going south, and finally at Plaxtell Green Lane, at which point it had kind of disappeared. And then a little while later on, there were captures of an almost identical vehicle traveling back the other way. And that was key because there was no vehicle that went out and back in that way. So we now had Ben Lacomba's vehicle on the move between around 2 a.m. in the morning to around 4.30 a.m. in the morning, the night that Sarah had gone missing. So why was Ben Lacomba's vehicle moving for two and a half hours or so that night when he said he was alone and asleep in his own bedroom all night? Despite neighbor CCTV capturing his vehicle return at 4.30 a.m., was it really Ben who was driving it the night Sarah vanished? Detectives rewind the footage to see if anyone else entered the property before Sarah arrived home. Ben Lacombe told us that uh, he'd come home from work. CCTV footage showed that he came home about 10 past five in the evening. Detectives keep watching but no one else is seen entering the property before Sarah arrives. But it was the neighbor's CCTV which flagged up another interesting detail. Ben Lacombe had a sophisticated CCTV system installed at his own address. From the neighbor's CCTV, we were able to see, going back and viewing three months' worth of footage, that the CCTV cameras on Ben Lacombe's house was on almost every single night running up to when Sarah went missing. And we know that because you can see the infrared lights of the cameras through the other footage to see when they're on and when they're switched off. 
so we know that after midnight, the cameras were switched off on Ben Lacomba's house. With more and more discrepancies in Ben's account, police start to believe he knows more about Sarah's disappearance than he lets on and start to piece together his movements. We are able to show that when Ben Lacomba drove home from work the day that Sarah went missing, he'd passed some cameras and we could see that his car was spotlessly clean. The following morning after Sarah had gone missing, Ben Lacomba took the children to school, passing other CCTV cameras. Now that morning, the car is now dirty. There is mud up both sides of his car and around the tires and the wheels of his car that wasn't there when we saw him arrive home the day before. Around 10.30 that morning, he went to the office where his cab firm is that he worked for to see one of his colleagues. When we see it arrive outside that office, the car is spotlessly clean again. It appears that on the night Sarah went missing, Ben Lacomba drove somewhere in his vehicle, resulting in it getting covered in mud. But there's a two-hour window where the vehicle goes off radar. So where did he drive to? And where is Sarah? Having carried out some good old-fashioned detective work and despite not having found a body, police make a decision. So it was on the Monday, doing a formal review of what we had so far, that we moved the investigation from being a missing person investigation into the next day when it became a homicide investigation. They said they weren't going to do a television appeal, and I thought, they know something's happened. And on you, you just know that you're not going to see her again. You know that. Police believe Ben Lacomba murdered Sarah. But with no cause of death or clear motive, need to work harder than ever to build a case for an arrest. Phone records prove Sarah sent her final text at 10 p.m. Their home CCTV was switched off at midnight, giving Ben a two-hour window in which police believe he killed Sarah before putting her in his car and driving off. The defendant having driven to some kind of deposition site, a, a grave uh, where he had disposed of Sarah's body. And then returned along the same route where he's picked up again on CCTV. There was mud on his car the next day, which he um, had cleaned off promptly before going to the taxi office. It was a pre-planned murder that Ben carried out. He killed Sarah. And myself and my team at the Major Crime Department, we instigated plans on that day to have Ben Lacomba arrested on suspicion of the murder of Sarah Wilgreen. Please, can you open the door, please? Morning. When I found out that you know he'd actually been arrested for murder, it's a feeling of anger, hurt, hate, all of the things that you'd associate with your partner being killed. It's just a massive shock to the system. It's just unbelievable what goes through your mind. Now, now all the questions are is, where is she? What did he do? How did he do it? Did she suffer? Was it quick? You just don't know the answers to it. I 
Okay. So you are uh, under arrest today on suspicion of the murder of your ex-partner. And I understand current um, you still live in the same address as Sarah Welgrey. Now, as I say, you're here on suspicion of murdering her. We believe she may be dead, and that may be at your hand. So, did you kill her? The pressure is on to find Sarah's body, establish a cause of death, and prove a motive to enable police to charge their suspect. It was a vast operation, and one that has involved uh, help from not only officers and staff from across Kent Police, but from across other forces nationally, using experts from the fire service, the marine unit searching water, searching confined spaces. We've searched around 1,400 different areas. We haven't found Sarah. With searches proving fruitless and the clock ticking, detectives press Ben further. So, I'm not clear at the moment, Ben, whether you're just trying to think of an answer or whether you've decided not to answer the question. He remained utterly silent. He did not answer any of our questions. He did not give us any information. He stayed absolutely silent and stared at the floor through seven hours' worth of interviews. After failing to answer any questions and despite no body being found, police charge Ben with the murder of Sarah Wellgreen. But what really went on that night? And why did their once loving relationship end in such a tragedy? In a Kent village, the body of Mum of Five, Sarah Wellgreen, has still not been found. But police pursue a case of murder and have charged 38-year-old taxi driver, Ben Lacomba. It's hard to believe that it's happening. I know you see things like that, everything going on in the news and see it on newspapers and things like that all the time. You never think it will hit home, never, until one day it just turns up on your doorstep. In September 2019, the trial into a nobody murder case begins at Woolwich Crown Court. When you prosecute a case in which the body of the deceased has not been found, it presents unique challenges in the trial. And those challenges is to demonstrate that the defendant that you're prosecuting is responsible for killing the deceased. The prosecution reveals to the court a conversation between Ben and police a few days before he was arrested. We asked Ben Lacomba if we could take information from his mobile phone, and he said to us that actually he wouldn't give us his phone. It was very late. He wanted to go to sleep, uh, and he would give us his phone the next day. As it turned out, and what we later captured on CCTV, was that Ben Lacomba didn't go to bed. He left the address. He traveled around and went into the Dartford and the Greenhithe area and parked up for a few minutes late at night near the River Thames. There was CCTV footage of the defendant in the pouring rain, desperately trying to get rid of something. And the prosecution suggested that that was the defendant trying to get rid of his own telephone. We knew from other evidence that he had purchased a new telephone in the days that followed Sarah's disappearance. And he was obviously keen to get rid of his own telephone, a telephone which could have given the police an indication of his whereabouts on the night of the 9th of October. The prosecution reveals further evidence linking Ben to murder. Although the police didn't know exactly what had happened to Sarah's body, they knew that there had been a period of an hour and a half or so where that vehicle had disappeared. And it seemed likely that as part of the planning, Ben Lacoma had already chosen where it was he was going to dispose of Sarah's body. It may even have been that he had already dug her grave. When we did a search of Sarah Wellgreen and Ben Lacomba's home, we found a very large 
shovel in his shed. The defendant's account of why he needed a shovel of that type at his trial would later become that the shovel was there for his mother to use to tend to the flower beds at the front of his property. Well, on any view, the flower beds at the property didn't require a shovel of that size. And the explanation given just simply wasn't a credible reason for having a shovel of that type. But it was a shovel that was relatively new in its appearance and was consistent with the type of implement that someone would use to dig a grave quickly. Despite presenting their evidence to court, police still have no obvious motive as to why Ben would kill the mother of his three children. But as the trial unfolds, more information about the couple and their relationship comes to light. Ben Lacombe uh, was born in Greenwich, grew up in Charlton. Early 2000s, he moved to Mallorca, where he was hoping to find work as a an airline pilot, a train as an airline pilot. In December 2004, Ben met Sarah via an online dating site. In the beginning, when Ben first met my mum, from what I could tell as a child, was he was, he was a nice bloke. From what from me and Jack had seen, he was all right, he was nice. And everything seemed great, really, to begin with. Desperate to create a stable home environment and provide her sons with a father figure and a better lifestyle, Sarah quit her job and moved to Mallorca to start over with Ben and her two sons. Obviously, Sarah thought, oh, this is going to be a good life. You know, I really want to give this a try. And it did sound good. But it became clear to the courtroom that their new life in the sun didn't work out as planned. Unable to speak the language, Sarah couldn't get a job and missed her family and friends back in the UK. Ben's dream to become an airline pilot failed to materialise and instead he worked a low-paid airport job. In the end, they moved back to England. By that point, they'd had their first trial together and they moved to New Ash Green. The couple settled into village life. Sarah got a good job while Ben started working as a taxi driver but cracks soon started to appear in their relationship. They muddled along, arguing, bickering, fighting for months after that, and they finally split up. Sarah had made her mind up. She'd had enough. But if Sarah thought splitting with Ben was going to be easy, she was mistaken. He threw her, Lewis and Jack, out on the street, keeping their three youngest children inside the house with him. I was angry with Ben but that had been built up through a few months of just listening to the arguments and things like that, and then that just thrown us all out. It just was just unfair on us, really. We had nowhere else to go. The next morning, Ben already had a court hearing arranged, and he stated in court that Sarah abandoned her children. Could he have custody? And he was awarded custody. It was all pre-planned, and Sarah could not defend herself because she did not know what was happening. Distraught that she no longer had access to her youngest three children, Sarah and her two eldest sons moved in with her mum and stepdad. We were absolutely devastated. You see your child crying and you can't help them. And we literally scraped up every, you know, everything we had to go, go and see a solicitor. But things took a positive turn for Sarah in August 2016 when she was awarded full custody of the children. Not only that, she met boyfriend Neil. Despite this, Sarah was terrified that Ben would attempt to take the children away from her if she moved in with Neil. So she made an unlikely peace offering with Ben to raise their three children under the same roof. Sarah wasn't happy about living with Ben. There was definitely animosity between the two of them. You know, they've been together for a number of years. That didn't work out for various different reasons. Yet Sarah had a plan. To buy Ben out of their four-bedroom family home, 
and she soon secured a new job with a big enough pay rise to make this happen. And after arriving home from work on 9th October 2018, she tells Ben her plan. Ultimately, Ben had lost control. The house was going to be put up for sale. He was going to lose his home, even though he was going to get half the equity. And he'd lost not just, you know, the property which he loved so much, but he lost control of the children. When you look at Ben Lacomba, he would have been left with almost nothing. Because he would have found himself in a position that Sarah was in not long before. And I think that probably pressured him into doing something stupid. Ben was the only one that would have a motive for killing Sarah. Nobody else. Ben had everything to gain from getting Sarah out of the picture permanently. After a gruelling 30-day trial at Woolwich Crown Court, the jury returns its verdict. Ben is found guilty of Sarah Wellgreen's murder. He is sentenced to 27 years in prison. Twenty-seven years for Ben Lacomba is not enough. Ben Lacomba should never see the light of day until he admits to those five children where he's put their mother. I've got one child who came home crying the other day because he wanted their mummy to pick them up from school one last time. So no, not enough. The case of Sarah Wellgreen is among a small number of convicted murder cases in the UK in which the victim's body has never been found. But the community has never given up hope of finding her. We give the family hope that one day they will be able to find her, otherwise they've not got that hope to hold on to. And that they know that we're still looking, and they yeah. know that we won't stop looking, no. do they? It's not been forgotten. No, no. not at all. We would like closure. All of us would like closure. For the body to be disclosed, to have a proper funeral, will probably help us all put it to bed. Two years on from her disappearance, Sarah's family are slowly coming to terms with life without her. Ben's actions have caused me to lose my mum for some of my siblings to lose their mother and their father at the exact same time. And it's just, it's, a, it's an unthinkable thing. It really is. You never expect anything like this to ever happen to you and you wouldn't wish it on the worst person. It's just a horrible sunken feeling and just a hole in your heart that you'll never fill. It is very raw. There's not a day goes by when you don't think about it, so whether it's Something is played on the radio, you see something, oh, Sarah, Sarah would like that, or something the children say. Yeah, there is never a day goes by, and I don't think that will ever change for any of us. And until she is found, the question remains, where is Sarah Wellgreen?
Ich 
Würme noch, wo ich sie machen habe. Ja, ich habe nicht was. Ja, und ich habe nicht was, wo ich sie würden, so wird es auch gepicht, so anders. Ja, wo ich sie haben nicht was, wo ich sie würden, nicht aus dem Ohr. Und dann wird es sich nicht gut aus, die Leute, nicht mehr. Sniff <laughs> Ich <lacht> Ja, ich kann euch auch schon ein bisschen sehen, wie viel du hast. Ich kann euch auch schon ein bisschen sehen, wie viel du hast. Ich kann euch auch schon ein bisschen sehen, wie viel du hast. Ich kann euch auch sch